Hello, everybody. Welcome. I'm Ben Powell, the Executive Director of the Free Market Institute here at Texas Tech. Welcome to our second installment of our public lecture series this semester. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, uh, I'll just preview that the next event is coming up on November 7th with Todd Zwicky on why is the rule of law, oh, excuse me, what is the rule of law and why it's important. We kind of accidentally uh, have a, a lawyer heavy uh, public lecture series this fall with uh, John and then Todd. Uh, that one will be over in the Rawls College of Business, same time as usual, uh, Thursday, November 7th. Uh, we're very pleased to have with us today uh, John Hasness. John Hasness is a professor of business at Georgetown's McDonough School of Business and a professor of law at Georgetown University Law Center in Washington, D.C., where he teaches courses in ethics and in law. Uh, professor Hasness is also the executive director of the Georgetown Institute for the Study of Markets and Ethics, uh, whose mission is to produce research on matters related to ethics of market activity, improve ethics pedagogy, and educate the broader non-academic community about ethical issues related to the functioning of markets. He received his BA in philosophy from Lafayette College, and his JD and PhD in legal philosophy from Duke University, and his LLM from, in legal education from Temple Law School. Professor Hasdis is the author of more than 50 scholarly studies and three books, Tonight, he's here to talk about his most recent book, published this summer by Oxford University Press, Common Law Liberalism, A New Theory of the Libertarian Society, which, while we don't have copies of that book here for sale, uh, if he succeeds in convincing you that this is interested, uh, interesting enough to purchase his book, there's a QR code on the sign out at the table there that gets you 30% off if you order it online that way. So, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor John Hasness. Thanks very much. Thanks. I appreciate the Institute for inviting me out here to talk about my book. Um, I will try to do that. I'm not quite sure how to talk about the book, so what I will do is quickly give you an overview and then hopefully entertain some of your questions. But let me start with a little background. The title of the book is Common Law Liberalism. I want to talk for a moment about the common law just to give you some background to understand the nature of the argument that the book contains. Right. Um, in our system, in our legal system, there's two types of law. One is legislation. That's the law that comes from the state legislatures, that comes from Congress. That's the kind that are made by the political agents of the population. The other type of law is common law. Common law is law that's not created intentionally by human beings. And the majority of our law is common law. So contract law is something that evolved over time by actual cases being decided and people following rules that led to good results. Contract law is common law. Tort law, which I'll talk about, which is the law that governs personal injuries, is common law. Property law is common law. Actually, most of our criminal law is also common law. What that means, and our commercial law, is common law. So what that means is most of the law that undergirds our society and makes our society work wasn't created by political agents. It wasn't created intentionally by any particular human beings. To use a quote from Adam Ferguson, the common law is something that's a product of human action, but not of human design. And most of our law is common law. We also, of course, have legislation, which is the law that's made intentionally by the political representatives of the population. So with that background, I can try to give you an overview of what the theses are in the book. And I'm going to say that the book has two theses. The first one I call the moderate thesis. And that's that good public policy analysis requires a comparative assessment of the effectiveness of common law and legislation as regulatory mechanisms. That human beings live in society. Sometimes we do bad things. We need mechanisms that will regulate our behavior, make sure that we're not injuring others, allows us to cooperate. And there are two regulatory mechanisms that exist. One is legislation, the other is common law. My, the my thesis is that if you want to do good public policy analysis, you should compare the two and see which one's more effective. Um, I'm going to say that conventional political philosophy is based on a false dilemma. Here's the false dilemma. Human action is either unregulated, 
or regulated by the government. That's usually the way we think about it. Human beings, if they're not subject to any regulation, will do all of these harmful things. What's the alternative to have the government regulated? I think that's a false dilemma because I think there's a third option that we should consider. So that's a modern thesis. The book has a more radical thesis, and that's that a peaceful and prosperous society can exist without legislation. Common law can do it all. And ultimately, without any essential services being supplied on a monopolistic basis by a government. So that suggests that a good society does not require the existence of a state. And I called this the moderate thesis and the radical thesis because it seemed like a better idea than calling it the same thesis and the insane thesis. <laughs> but at any rate, the book makes arguments for both. The first half of the book is an argument for the moderate thesis, and I'm hoping that that carries the day with most of the readers. Um, to, just to get, illustrate the argument or the typical argument that I'm opposing, I ran into this quote when I was, I was reading a book called The Identity Trap. It's a good book. But right in the beginning, here's what the author said. Humans need government. Without some central authority, we would be unable to keep the peace between rival bands of warriors or to provide basic public goods. Even the most ingenious human would fail to thrive if she had to live in fear of being murdered by her neighbors or lack access to schools, hospitals, and basic medical care. So this is the way things are usually presented. Government, regulation, government is the cure for the ravages of the state of nature, and those are the only two options. So this is what I'm resisting by saying that there's another alternative that should be considered. All right, let me do a, try to do a quick overview of the elements of the book, and then hopefully leave a good, good amount of time for discussion. Okay. This is really an overview of the chapters that goes really quick. The first chapter is about criminal law. Right. I think that when we talk about criminal law, we're faced with a specific instantiation of this general dilemma. dilemma. Why do we need criminal law? Because this, you need criminal law or else there's no mechanism for discouraging violent, harmful, or dishonest action. You can stop people from doing these things through criminal law, or else people will run around and do all these bad things. And that's the way things are presented. I think that that's not the proper way of comparing the options. The proper comparison is you compare regulation or criminal law as a way of ordering society against alternative mechanisms for discouraging violent, harmful, or dishonest action. And there are some. I have tort law on the board. Tort law is older than criminal law. It predates criminal law. The way human beings provided order in society and prevented harmful behavior and got cooperation was through what today is called tort law. Back then it wasn't. But basically, if you do something that harms another, then you have to pay recompense. You have to make amends. You have to do something that restores the other person to the position he or she would have been in, or else you won't be accepted in your society. You'll be chased out. In order for societies to function, they needed some way of preventing predation and incentivizing cooperation. And what evolved naturally was a system of compensation. And tort law gave us the basic order that allowed our society to progress. Over the course of English history, tort law was the way we had order for a long time. And criminal law had to slowly but surely, and it wasn't easy, take over the area of criminal law. I mean, of tort law. Criminal law evolved mostly because the church wanted to control people so that they would act properly. The penitential law became engrafted into the law by, so that the crown could make people behave properly. And also, the criminal law was a great way for the crown to extort revenue from the people. Every time somebody was convicted of a crime, the crown got money. But it wasn't easy to supplant tort law. Criminal law slowly evolved. And eventually became the way we provide order by basically undermining the uh, effectiveness of tort law. But tort law still exists. Perhaps the best example of that is famously in the 1990s, O.J. Simpson was acquitted of murder in his criminal case. But he was found liable in the civil case. And for the rest of his life, he was paying the judgment to the the family of the people he was accused of murdering. Tort law still exists, it's still there. So what's the proper comparison? 
How effective is criminal law at providing order in society compared to an alternative mechanism where we have tort law associated with ways of restraining behavior? That's the proper comparison. I read the book to find out the way I come out on it, but I think tort law can do a lot of the work, and it does it without the political involvement. And we're all afraid of prosecutors being influenced by political mechanisms, by their budgets, by all kinds of things that aren't necessarily what's the best result in the case. In fact, I don't watch too many of the law, show, the law shows on TV. In fact, nobody watches TV anymore. But the shows uh, are almost always about the way prosecution can be distorted or swayed by all kinds of um, malevolent forces. That's true. But in tort law, that's not the case. It's the person who's injured against the person who did the injury. It's an alternative mechanism. And I'm going to recommend to you that you evaluate criminal law by making that comparison. Tort law tends to look pretty good. So that's the first chapter. The second chapter is about regulation of the market. Again, we have a false dilemma. What do we have? We have unregulated markets, or else we have markets regulated by the government. You need government regulation to prevent the free market from doing all kinds of harmful things. I think that that's not the correct analysis. The proper comparison is we can have regulation supplied by non-market forces, that's a non-government forces, or by the government. What are non-governmental forces? Lots of our regulation is provided by our ethical beliefs. People don't run, you know, this is, life is not like the movie The Purge, right? right? People are restrained and regulated by their ethical beliefs. That's an important regulatory device. Custom is an important regulatory device. Those of you that are in business know that customary practices are what you have to follow if you're going to do business effectively. And the other strong regulatory device that's not part of government is the common law, which is tort law. Right. We're regulated by all of these things, and we can be regulated by the government. And the question is, which does a better job of providing the kind of regulation that will allow us to live in a prosperous society? I got a couple of slides to try to illustrate this. This is the way, I'm sorry, I call it the academic conception. That's a little pejorative. Right. Um, this is the way things are often depicted if you go to a, a typical economics or political science course at some other university that's not Texas Tech with the Free Market Institute. What's the market? And the market is the realm of unregulated voluntary transactions. That's when people can do whatever they want to do. And they can do all kinds of harmful things. So what's law? Law is the regulation of voluntary transactions for the public good. Right? The politicians come in, they pass laws that make it so people don't do harmful things and the common good is advanced. That's a particular way of seeing things that is often presented in university courses. I want to suggest this is a better, a more realistic picture. I call it the real world conception. The market is voluntary transactions that are regulated by customary practices, by ethics, and by civil liability. If you think about what businesses are afraid of, are they afraid of a small fine from a federal agency or a multi-million dollar judgment from some rapacious tort lawyer out there? Like we all hate the ambulance chasers. Why do we hate them? Because they're so effective regulatory mechanisms. But that's what regulates the market. The market without government is this. It's regulated by custom ethics and civil liability. So what's law? Well, law is legislation. But law is also common law. Legislation is the regula regulation of voluntary transactions to serve whatever the legislative interest is, which is usually determined by who's, whichever party is the, predominant, the politically dominant interest at the time. And it's also common law, because that's part of our law. So if you look at it properly, there's a part of the law that's internal to the market. That's the common law. The common law is the market's <coughs> internal regulatory device. And so the proper question we should be asking is, how much regulation by the government do we need that's not already being done by the common law? If you want to have an argument for regulating the market by government forces, by political forces, then you have to show that there's some regulation that's not being provided already by the common law. And that's the comparison you should make with regard to things like, to use economic terminology, internalizing negative externalities. Tort law, civil liability, is the mechanism built into the market 
that's designed to internalize negative externalities. And so if the market already does it, do we really need government regulation? It's possible, but you have to make an argument based on the proper comparative assessment. That's the second chapter, and I apply this in the third chapter to matters of environmental regulation. People are concerned about the environment. We need environmental regulation. The basic um, starting point for most thinking about environmental regulation is the article, The Tragedy of the Commons. You may or may not be familiar with that, but the idea behind that is that commonly held resources will be overexploited. So the air is not owned, rivers are not owned, and therefore people will make use of it in such a way that they, they, get, they get the benefit, they don't bear any of the cost, and as a result, they'll overexploit the resource. And that's why we have environmental problems. And the tragedy of the commons says, look, the only solution to this is you have to change the incentives. You have to like, restrict access. You punish people who try to access the commons and overuse it. That's one way of solving the problem. And the other way of solving the problem is to privatize the commons. Because if we own it ourselves, we don't overexploit it. If we bear the cost of the use, then we're much more careful about how we use it. We don't overuse it. So that's the basic starting point for environmental analysis. The problem is when you go to regulatory policy or environmental policy, the way it's depicted is we're going to have environmental degradation or we have government regulation. Again, it's a black and white type of false dilemma. Right? Government regulation of environmental matters, that's a way of restricting access. If you do this, we'll punish you. If you put some pollutant in the air, if you put pollutants in the water, we're going to give you a fine, we'll punish you for that. So that's a way of restricting access. You discourage people from using it. That's one way of solving environmental problems. But what's ignored is the other alternative. The other alternative is to privatize the resource. And privatization doesn't mean you put fences around the air or you put fences in the water. It's not that kind of privatization. Privatization is just aligning individual incentives with the preservation of the resource. There's a lot of examples of this. Again, I don't want to make the whole lecture about this, but I'm going to make a recommendation. I have to do this. There's an old uh, Nova TV show from public television called The Kingdom of the Seahorse. You can still get it. If you want to go get this, it's a wonderful hour show. The first half hour is everything you ever want to know about the seahorse. Seahorses, the male has the babies. There's, the, there's hundreds of babies that come out. They are territorial, they hook themselves into sea, all about the seahorse. And there's this one scientist who's concerned about the depletion of the resource that's going extinct. Because in China, people think the seahorse, chopped up seahorses, have aphrodisiac qualities. So it's valuable and all of these poor people who live along the coast of the Philippines are taking all the seahorses and selling them and it's going extinct. And there's a marine biologist from England and she wants to do something about the seahorse. And she tries the United Nations, nothing. She tries the government, nothing. Finally, she goes and lives in this village called the Hondman, because there was a project on this in the Baltimore Aquarium. And she lives there for a while, and she just watches people, and nobody trusts her. This is, you'll love this show. Nobody trusts her because like, you know, white-skinned, English-speaking people have come before to help them, and it's always been bad. So she lives there for a while, and eventually she says, you know, if you take pregnant seahorses out, then you're depleting the resource. But if you left them in, they'd have a lot of babies, you'd have more seahorses. And then we can't do that, because if we don't take it, somebody else will. So she shows them how to build little floating cages with initials on it. So if you find one of these and you put it in your cage, you can leave the seahorse in the water until the babies are born, and then you take it. And that works. And then she starts showing them, like, if you put this part of the area aside, and you don't, you don't fish there, and you just leave them there, all the babies will come out, and you can have those. And pretty soon, the area's got plenty of seahorses, and everybody's making more money, and they're happy. Is that a happy ending? No, because everybody up and down the coast knows there's seahorses here. So they come and try to steal them. And the next thing you know, you've got these villagers in outrigger canoes with lights at night, guarding the area. And after a while, the people up and down the coast, want to, it's too difficult to get them. So they come and they say, what are you doing? And they learn. And this video ends with her teaching people how to engage in private seahorse farming. And the entire population of the seahorses say that all of the people benefit from it. That's privatization. 
It's aligning incentives with the preservation of resources. That's what common law civil liability does. If you want to read the book, there's many examples of how the, when the carrying capacity or when you're about to deplete the resource and people come into conflicts, how do you resolve conflicts? You can get big brother government to tell you what to do, or you have lawsuits. And the lawsuits create what are called property rights. And the property rights show people how they can get individual benefits from preserving the resource. That's another way of dealing with environmental regulation. It's not all government or nothing. There's another option, which is privatization. You can get that through common law. That's the third chapter. All right, this is my favorite chapter. I love this. It's a chapter on freedom of speech, because that's a big issue these days. The false dilemma is speech is unregulated, or else it has to be regulated by the government, right? We can't, we need to have the government regulate what people can say, or else people will say a lot of bad things. This is a pretty important issue for the last few years, and this year being an election year. I can't turn on the TV without hearing people say we have to regulate misinformation and disinformation. Right? Freedom of speech in the United States has been governed by what I call the great non sequitur. This is the, worst, the greatest non sequitur of all time. Everybody's familiar with it. The reason why you have to have government regulation of speech is because you can't allow people to yell fire in a crowded theater, right, and cause a panic. You have to be able to suppress that kind of speech. The reason why that's a great non sequitur is because, yeah, you, people aren't allowed to yell fire in a crowded theater. It's a tort. It would subject them to civil liability. Under state law, that's already banned, not by government measures, but by the common law. The common law has regulated this already. The fire and credit theory was introduced in 1919 by Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes in a suit on freedom of speech. It was to just, the suit, Schneck, was to justify the following measure. The government was imprisoning people who were distributing leaflets saying, you should oppose the draft of World War I. And that was a clear and present danger to the well-being of the society. This quote comes from a case which is a pretty clear example of suppressing political dissident speech. The fire in a crowded theater is a non sequitur. That is indeed punishable, but not, you don't need government for that. The common law takes care of it. What's free speech, if you ask me? Free speech is speech free from government regulation, from the action of legislatures, or in this case, the action of the executive, from the government suppressing speech. That's free speech. Right? We want that. What we don't want is free and irresponsible speech. What's free and responsible speech? Speech free from government regulation and subject to common law regulation. There's all kinds of regulation on speech built into the common law that's got nothing to do with politicians. Defamation. You can't accuse someone of something and damage their reputation without suffering, without being sued for defamation. Misrepresentation. There's a tort of tortious interference. You can't engage in certain kinds of speech that destroy other people's businesses. We have the tort of intentional infliction of emotional distress. There are some things you just can't say because they're too damaging. But most important, most people know there's a tort of negligence. This is what regulates speech. One of the cases I teach when I'm teaching torts, a woman goes to a workout place. She's overweight. She signs something. She wants to get in shape. The first thing that happens is the instructor tells her to lift a weight that's way too heavy, and she's injured, and she's suing them. She's suing them because the speech was irresponsible speech. He shouldn't have told her to do that. That's regulating speech. We've got plenty of speech regulation that keeps us responsible. What we don't need is government regulation. So again, the correct way of looking at things is, do we need regulation by the government in addition to common law, or will common law do it itself? So most of the first half of the book is designed to present this third alternative and to try to have you make the comparative analysis. Um, Later on, I get to the radical, the insane, but the radical thesis, that you actually don't need the state for anything. And so I talk about the law of anarchy. Uh, what is the law of anarchy? Some anarchists say, you know what law is? It's if everybody gets together and makes up a contract and they all agree to abide by it, then that's the rules because everybody agrees. I guess that could happen. 
but it's unlikely to happen in any society of any size. And we don't need it, because we already have all of the law that allows us to live together and cooperate. It already exists. It's called the common law. Common law is law. It's binding, in, independent of individual consent. Nobody agrees to be bound by the rules of tort law or contract. It's the law. We're all bound by it. So it's binding. It's just not made by any particular human beings. It doesn't subject us to the will of others. It's binding law without putting some people in the position of dominating others, without some people being able to tell other people what to do. Common law is the law that does not require a state. It doesn't, you don't need a government for common law. The evidence is we have common law and was made well before the government was making law. So we have a law that works so well that it undergirds our commercial society, it allows us to live together in peace. It gave us all of the wealth to have a society that government can come along and then try to make new rules for. But first, we had to get to that point, and that's what common law does. So common law is the law of anarchy. It's the law that allows us to live together without a state. We have a law of anarchy. That was the first step on the radical thesis. And then, Toward the end of the book, I try to show that you actually don't need the state for anything. We don't, you know, the statement up there, when I was thinking about this the first time, I was at a conference, I was with a wonderfully brilliant political philosopher, I'm talking to him, and he goes, oh yeah, you know, that's good. The best way to show something is possible is to show that it exists. And so, that's what I try to do. Do we need the state to make the law? Well, the law that undergirds our society was not made by the state. It, the law already exists. It's common law. You don't need the state for that. It's possible because it exists. How about courts? You know, we all know the Lockean argument. You have to have the state to provide impartial judges and the law and the police. But what about courts? Our law originated in a wide variety of competing courts. The monopolistic system of state courts dates to the late 19th century. The common law that I described to you, that came from a wide variety of different settlement procedures. There were ecclesiastical courts, there were merchant courts, there were shire courts, there were manorial courts. When it finally got into, when the, the King of England like, <laughs> took over a lot of the law, even in the royal courts, there were four different branches. There was the King's branch, there was Exchequer, there was Common Pleas, there was the Chancellery. And these were all in competition with each other. Our system of law arose in a system where the courts were variegated, and you could choose which one to go to based on how good the product was. So since we already had a system of courts that worked perfectly well to give us law, that suggests you don't need monopolistic courts in order to have a well-functioning society. But of course you need the state to give us police, right? You have to have police. Um, many of you may have seen or been familiar with the old show from Broadway, Oliver. It's a show on Broadway, there was a movie, Oliver. I'm probably speaking out of you know, my generation. I knew that Oliver, Oliver has a song in it where the boys are going off to engage in pickpocketing and they're leaving Fagan behind and they're singing a song you know, we know the Bow Street Runners, but they don't know this tune, but I'll be back soon. Like, the Bow Street Runners are the first municipally organized police force in the British Commonwealth of countries. There were no police made by the government before 1749. And I just looked it up for this. There was only eight of them. It was a small group. Slowly but surely, police became taken over by governmental agencies. I, did this a while ago. I think you can still go to the Boston police website where it has up there first municipal police force in the United States since like 1832 or something like that. New York was 1840. What happened before then? We were in the war of all against all. Everything was energy. People were killing each other. We had society before 1749. Government police apparently aren't necessary. There's a lot of ways of organizing people in order to provide these services. And to a great extent, 
they were privately organized. They were the equivalent of either bounty hunters, not bounty hunters, um, private detectives who would go after, chase after people and would be paid. And more often, they were organized by communities who just designated people to respond to calls. But it was all privately organized. You don't need the government for law. You don't need the government for courts. You don't need the government for police. But you need the government for national defense, right? You obviously need the government for national defense. So towards the end of the book, what I say is, well, don't worry. Be happy. Why? Because if a society ever started moving in a liberalized direction, if a government ever, if a society ever started moving to less government and more individual initiative and more people doing things that would create prosperity, and we depoliticized some of the law, we depoliticized some of the restrictions on government, we let common law do the work, the economic and material progress made by that society would be so great that before too long, Nobody would be able to attack us. Why is the United States the most powerful military force in the world? I think it's because of our economic prosperity and development and the fact that we got so rich so fast that we can develop all of these weapons that we, no one can challenge us. Wealth creates power. So if you're worried about national defense, okay, so you have the national defense. But the more you move in the direction of a non-state society, the more you have a situation in which not only can't people challenge you anymore, but if you move fast enough, one of the big issues in politics today is immigration. People want to come here. Why? Because life is better here. Because we have more prosperity. Because people would like to have what we have. If we moved in a liberal direction, other countries would eventually say, what's going on over there? They'd be like the other fishermen in the Philippines who are wondering what's going on in the Hondaman area where they have a lot more seahorses all of a sudden. I mean, what's going on over there? Can we get some of that? So by the time this becomes an issue, I don't think it would be a big problem. Well, I mean, Stop and um, entertain your comments with this idea. Why, if this is all true, why don't we have a society which has much more common law liberalism and less regulation by government, less political control? Aristotle famously said, he called man the rational animal. So the essential characteristic of the human being is our ability to reason. Human beings can reason, but other animals can't. That's the essential characteristic of human beings. We do have the ability to reason, but I don't think that that's human beings' essential characteristic. I think human beings' essential characteristic is that they have imagination. Human beings have imagination. That's why we can do the same thing time after time after time that doesn't work and imagine this time it will. That's why we can have government oppression in state after state after state, and we'll have a revolution, but this time, it'll be okay. We have imagination. I was talking to Ben about needing to change the example. At one point, I used to say, human beings can root for the Chicago Cubs and believe someday they'll win the World Series. So they did. I can't use that anymore. So now, human, people in New York still can root for the New York Jets and think that it'll win a Super Bowl again sometime because they have imagination. They have no rational basis for it, but they can imagine that it's true. Our ability to imagine that government can function impersonally and objectively and perfectly and is not made up of human beings who have their own personal and political interests that drive them one way or another. I don't do economics. These people do economics, I don't. But I've heard of public choice economics. Uh, if you understand what public choice economics is, you realize that governments don't function ideally. So because man is the imaginative animal, that's what can account for a thousand years of public support for government. It's our imagination. If we could only turn that off and all become like Mr. Spock, then we would see the light of day and we would go in the direction of common law liberalism. Now let me stop there and entertain your comments.
Comments, questions? Go ahead. Thank you for the talk, John. You made a persuasive case that common law liberalism is possible. Could you talk a little bit about why you think it would be better? Um, I, this is not a sarcastic answer. I think I just did. <laughs> right, uh, where, does it, where does our prosperity come from? You have contract law that allows us to make contracts. You have commercial law that has our ability to interact. This is where prosperity comes from. We have tort law that prevents us from harming each other. Property law, property rights, also creates the kind of boundaries that allow us to cooperate, which is better than holding everything in common. The way the common law evolved made us able to cooperate and prosper. Co human cooperation is what causes prosperity. That's what we want. It's, it's conceivable that you could get that out of legislation, but you don't need to because we have it before legislation exists. Once you have legislation, what goes on? You guys, you guys do the public choice. I don't. Right? But special interests can get control of the government, get laws passed to an event that give them an advantage over others. It's not the general interest that's being served anymore. It's the politically powerful interest. Right? In the United States, we had a century in which whites controlled the governments in the southern states and blacks were disenfranchised because they had the power. That's not necessarily a superior organization. Unless you think, unless you have imagination, and you think the government can function to create the general good and not serve particularly, particular parochial interests, you're going to do better with common law. One thing that's important about common law is it's rent-seeking resistant. You can't buy favors in the common law. If you, some businesses devote tons of resources to getting a test case that will serve their interests. Maybe they even can get the one judge that will go their way, and they get the decision, and now they're happy. Until another plaintiff's lawyer comes along and sues again in another case, and then the president is overturned. It's a completely unstable way of getting political power. Um, everybody hates plaintiff's lawyers. Everybody hates plaintiff's lawyers. They turn over every rock looking for anything. In. You know, we all, why do we have um, warning signs all over ladders? How come people can't make football helmets anymore? It's those evil, weaselly plaintiff's lawyers out there that are just trying to find some way to regulate things so that they can gain. Right? Well, these plaintiff's lawyers are unpaid, taxpayers don't pay for it, regulators who are making sure we're all safe. That, that's an effective means of regulation to make us able to prosper. Since we're talking, since you asked the question, I'm going to go off topic and talk about one of my favorite things. The only tort case that most people have ever, ever heard of is the McDonald's coffee case. Right? So you're shaking your heads yes. That's the only thing you've ever heard of. And that's been presented to you as a Example of how the system is broken. Well, it's not. It's an example of how the system is fantastic. But right? McDonald's, as a matter of corporate policy, served coffee at between 180 and 190 degrees Fahrenheit. At that temperature, coffee spilled on a human being will cause third degree burns in between, I think, 7 and 13 seconds. So fast that you can't get it off your clothing. It's also Coffee can't be drunk at that temperature either. If it's at 150 degrees, it takes about 30 seconds. Right. Um, somebody drove up to a McDonald's and in a car ordered some coffee. Her grandmother was in the car. He gave the coffee to his grandmother. She foolishly tried to enter, open it by putting it between her legs. The top popped off and she was injured. She had burns. And she sued McDonald's for the cost of her injury, which was $750. McDonald said, no, I'm not paying. The lawyer took her case to court. In court, he presented to 12 ordinary people like you the fact that there had been 700 previous cases of serious burns from hot coffee being spilled on people. The company knew about it. They didn't change their policy. Oh, there were all these injuries before. This little old lady, now, he, he went to the jury and said, they were serving a dangerous product. They knew it was dangerous. Send him a message that you shouldn't do this anymore. And he offered, he asked the jury to provide punitive damages equal to two days' worth of profits made by McDonald's. 
And the jury said yes. Okay. What happened? Now, the reason why I like telling the story is, at the time I was driving, I worked at Georgetown. I was driving in, I drive into Georgetown every morning, I had the radio on. I was listening to NPR so they didn't have unbiased. I listened to NPR. It's got a story about they contacted all the fast food places. Every place across the country is now serving coffee at 150 to 160 degrees. The next day, everybody in the entire country is safe from these third degree burns because of one little old lady and one tort lawyer. That's regulation. That's safety regulation. Now there's a loss, right? What's the loss? Why do companies serve coffee that hot? And it's because people like to buy it at drive-in windows and drive away, and then if they drink it later, it's still warm. So that's lost. That's the loss. And what's gained is nobody gets third-degree burns from scalding hot coffee anymore. If you had waited for government agencies to regulate coffee for safety, you'd still be waiting. And even if you, they did try to regulate it, all the lobbying would mean it would be at 177 degrees or something like that. The virtue of the tort system is it gives us real safety regulation and you can't buy it off. Like, there's nothing McDonald's or the other big companies could do to get out from under this regulation. Where if it's government regulation, all you got to do is the right kind of lobbying or get the right people elected and they'll fix, serve your interest. So that's a very roundabout way of saying Commonwealth liberalism is better because it is more likely to serve the general interest and not the politically powerful interest. I'll stand this way so the room can hear. Uh, so let me follow up with a kind of different version of this. So I can imagine listening to this lecture and saying, okay, we used to have just common law, multiple competing courts. And sure, it was fine for centuries, although we were still poor back then. And now we have criminal law and legislation and government. Why did we get it? Didn't we get it to improve the system that's already there? Or did we get it for some other reason? Yeah, we got it for some other reason. Whenever anything is proposed through to be part of legislation or through government power, what's the reason given? Because this will be better for everybody. Because this will improve life. That's the reason that's given. What's the reason why it's actually advanced is usually because some interest is being served. Once you have legislation, you have law being made by the people who control the organs of political power. And they make the law to serve their own interests. Um, why did things end up this way? It's because human beings like to control other people's interests. Common law is the law of anarchy. Common law is the law of a free or libertarian society. Human beings would rather control other people's behavior. They'd rather have the power. The problem with freedom is that you have to work to gain. In a free society, you have to cooperate with others. You can't exploit others. Um, I don't know. It's, the analogy I always think of is, I remember back to when I was a child, there's three of us. And we would always try to appeal to our parents to give us the most candy or whatever else. We wanted some third party to come in and advance our interest at the expense of my siblings. And when they went around, what did we have to do? Well, we could beat each other up, or we could actually cooperate and make some kind of deal. Human beings will first try to exploit others, and that's what the political process is for. And only if you can prevent that will they cooperate. So cooperation is always like the second best option. And the only way to make it so that you have cooperation is to try to keep the organs of power out of the hands of a political agent. So how did we get here? People like power. They got power. They replaced the common law with the legislation that serves particular interests, I do not have a solution to how you prevent that. It would be great if we could. When the United States was founded, the idea was that we could have all of these guaranteed rights that were beyond the scope of democratic control. So you have the Bill of Rights, you have the First Amendment, all these amendments. The amendments are saying what the government can't do. It was to put a large segment of our life outside of the control of government and democracy. And I think that that's one reason why the United States advanced as rapidly as it did. 
As we go from the founding till now, what we find is the area of guaranteed rights shrinks and more, shrinks more and more. The area of the gov government control and democracy grows until we get to a point at which there's a lot of rent seeking going on. There's a lot of people that are that pursuing power. So we tried an experiment where we tried to keep things in the realm of common law and away from legislation. It worked for a while. How can we get back to it? I don't know. How can you do it the next time? I don't know. I'm just a philosopher, not a political theorist, a political scientist. I'd love somebody to come up with something that would work. Uh, we have a large world where all kinds of things are going on. Somewhere, somebody's going to try it again. And if they do, they'll probably get results like we did the, the first time. And if that doesn't happen, we're doomed. I'm sorry. It's, I, I can't be more, more optimistic. Yeah. Uh, you make America Valley case for common law, so what future do you see for countries that have a civil law tradition? Does any future for liberalism there? Yeah, I like common law. Civil law traditions can work the same way. I mean, in civil law, the pre they don't follow precedent, and the judges get to do it uh, new, de, de novo each time. That's the way, so it's different, but the way it's practiced is not really that much different. Human beings want to save their labor. If somebody has made a decision or applied a rule that makes sense, other people will copy. The only reason why the common law works, the only reason why we get good law is as follows. People are in conflict. They need a way of resolving the conflict. In a common law system, somebody brings a lawsuit, the judge tries a, I'll illustrate it with something from a book I used to teach from. There's a, in the first year of law school, there's a book that's supposed to explain what the common law system is all about. And so it gives an example of a rule of law that was in Kentucky about when you can sue for trespass and it's whether something causes an impact or not. It's called the impact rule. And Kentucky adopted the rule. And it just didn't work because there was constant, there was a lot of continued conflict. There was all kinds of problems. The rule wasn't settling disputes. A similar case comes up in the neighboring state of Tennessee. And the judges in Tennessee said, Kentucky adopted the impact rule. And it's terrible. And so they tried a different rule, which worked better. And then pretty soon, like in the, all the states around, when the case came up, they said, let's go with what Tennessee's doing and not Kentucky. And they learned from trial and error which rule works best. 20 years later, Kentucky has another case comes up and says, this was stupid. And they changed it to the better rule. Common law is like markets. It's not smart because anybody made it smart. It's a trial and error process. You try solutions, the stupid ones don't settle conflicts, so there's more litigation, there's more lawsuits that keep coming up. And eventually somebody stumbles upon the right rule, and when it works, everybody copies it and it's stable. Our law of assault and battery, with the first case in my case book, is from 1340 something. There's another case from 1705. Because those rules, we figured out what they are, and they work, and they last. Right now, we have no idea what the right rules are for social media. We don't know what the right rules are for artificial intelligence. There's all kinds of dissension. But if we let the system work itself out, we'll eventually learn what rules will give us the safe use of these new technologies. My students always want to know why there's so many cases about railroads. Why do we talk about railroads all the time? Because in the 19th century, railroads were a new technology. It was beneficial, but we didn't know how to use it safely. And the lawsuits told us what rules railroads had to follow. That's the way things work. If it was a civil law system, it, it, the same thing would happen, even though it wouldn't be binding precedent. We would learn from other people's decisions which ones tend to work better, and that way you get good results in the long term. It's just you have to keep the government out and the power brokers out and let the system work. It can work in the civil law system as well. After all, Louisiana is not bad, right? And Louisiana is one of the... I mean, Louisiana has a civil law system, not a common law system, but it has pretty much the same rules. Yes? Two answers. Yeah, it would take long. What's the strongest argument for not using common law? The strongest argument is you have a problem that needs immediate attention and you can't wait. 
it's an emergency. And then is government action justified to deal with the emergency? That's the strongest argument for having government regulation because common law can't do it. So if you can come up with a situation like that, then you've got a good argument. I'll challenge you to find something like that. And then you have to be fortunate enough that the government actually comes up with the right solution. But it does take a long time. And the problem for, maybe to answer Ben's question, the problem is that human beings don't have any patience. We don't have patience. Again, I use a lot of stupid analogies. In college, I was a soccer player, and I was a defenseman. And it was horrible, because the attackers, right, they could play stupidly all day. They do something right and score a goal. They're the big hero. But the defense, what do we have to do? We have to make every single play correctly. Because if somebody gets by us and scores, we're the villain. And so the way you play defense is you don't attack the ball. You don't go try to take it away. You just try to slow up the other team so the rest of your team can come back and adjust. And your job is just to create time for the system to adjust. That's what common law is like. You need common law. Common law needs time to work and will give us a good answer. But we don't have patience. We're all, we all want to do the tackle. Um, <clears throat> And in, in 1990, for those of you who remember 1990, the big political issue was junk science in the courtroom. Right. This is going to destroy science. People think cell phones are causing brain cancer. All these people are getting into their, having lawsuits on completely bogus science. What can be done? And all of the politicians in Washington wanted to have all, all these tort reform measures. But if you remember the 1990s, we had divided government. So you had Republicans in control of Congress, and Clinton was president. And nothing could get done. The tort reform didn't get through. By 2000, the problem of junk science in the courtroom was solved. Because cases had made its way through the system, had actually gone up to the Supreme Court. You got a case called Kumutaya, which told us what the evidentiary standards are for getting things into the courtroom. The system had adjusted and come up with a good solution. You don't hear about it anymore because it works. The only reason why it worked is because even though it wasn't their desire, politicians were stopped from interfering. What we need to do is have the patience to let the system work it out. Human beings don't. We recognize a problem, we've got to solve it right away. Now, don't just stand there, do something is the motto of all political action. That's why we have to do something now for every problem that's identified. That's why we get bad results. If we had more patience, patience is a virtue, then common law could give us good answers. But again, I'm not a political Theorist, I don't know how you can get, get the patience you need other than intentionally and constantly voting to create divided government that gets nothing done. Then you'll have solutions evolve. Maybe one last question? Yes, yes. But yeah, but you know it's insane. Go ahead. <laughs> Okay. I'm As gonna, a small business owner, just uh, saying. I mean, don't get me wrong. I hate government rigs. Yeah. They cost me a fortune, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I like the idea, but in the real world, I can't really afford to right the wrongs against Mother Exxon. I understand your point, and there are cases like that. But my answer is going to be this. Tort law. That's poor person's law. That's the law of the people who have no resources, right? Big businesses have to pay for lawyers. They have legal departments that can do whatever they want to. But it used to be on television, now it's not on TV because nobody watches TV, but there's still all these big billboards on the highway, pictures of lawyers which call us, you know, we'll fight for you. If you it used to be science and Kirk, if you have a phone, you have a lawyer. Now it's just if you, if you have a lawyer, go to this website. People with no resources can go up against the biggest corporations in the world because of tort law. Because plaintiff's lawyers will take your case on a contingency fee basis. Because they're out there. There can't be anybody in the United States that suffers from methylphelioma that doesn't have a lawyer anymore, if you've seen any of the commercials, right? right? 
Tort law is the way the poor people or the people without resources can fight against the highly capitalized resources. That's what's that's a virtue of it. If you don't have tort law, then you've got the battle of the rich, and we're all left out. Tort law is the way, it's a poor person's law, it's the way we can challenge the um, McDonald's. Like this little old lady won $2.9 million from McDonald's because she had a lawyer and she had a good case, and she didn't have to pay for any of it. So generally speaking, tort law favors the people with the lower amount of capital. There are going to be cases where you're, you got a small business, you lose because it's, you, you couldn't go on a contingency fee. There are these problems. That's real. But generally speaking, this is how poor people get justice. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.